This is Domitian, the 11th Emperor of Rome and the 12th of the 12 Caesars, and he is very concerned with personal security. Naturally, as the most powerful man in the Empire, he has enemies, and to survive the turbulent world of Roman politics, you really have to take some precautions. So, I present to you Domitian's Guide to Maintaining the Exact Right Amount of Paranoia Required to Survive in the Roman Empire in the Late First Century. Step 1 in the plan to avoiding assassination as Roman Emperor is to get the army on your side. After all, emperors have enemies, and it's for the best that those enemies remain unarmed. So find the guys with the weapons and the know-how to use them, and raise their pay. That's a good trick to reminding them who the boss is. Always keep the soldiers loyal and satisfied, and they'll never turn against you. Step 2. Line the walls of the palace with polished moonstone. This creates a kind of room of mirrors. After all, the emperor has enemies, and those enemies might be in the palace itself. You don't want to be trusting other people to watch your back for you, so it's best that you can watch your own back by making every wall a mirror. When doing the duties of an emperor, you might have to see someone up close and personal who is potentially dangerous, like a criminal. Make sure that when they see you, they're always restrained and chained. After all, the emperor is the highest justice in the land, and criminals always have reason to fear justice. So it's a good idea to always have a sword nearby, just in case things go south. I keep mine under my pillow. Remaining safe as the Emperor of Rome requires good timekeeping. Domitian had been told by an astrologer when he was young that he was destined to die at midday, and astrologers are never wrong. So, he was always on top of what time it was, getting business done in the morning, collapsing into a frenzy of frantic anxiety and paranoia at noon, and then calming down in time for lunch. Now, all of this may seem like a bit much, but you have to remember that Domitian is only the 11th Emperor of Rome, and so far, natural causes haven't been a leading cause of death when it comes to Roman emperors. I mean, just look at what happened to Caligula, or Claudius, or Nero, or Otho, or Galba, or Vitellius. All of them were either murdered, betrayed, or forced into suicide by people who had pretended to be their friends right up until the point they betrayed them. And after all, Domitian has enemies, so it's reasonable to employ a certain degree of what the ignorant call paranoia. I mean, how exactly are you supposed to measure how paranoid to be anyways? I mean, the only way to do it is to dial back your paranoia until you're murdered, and then be like, oh yeah, a bit before then, that was the sweet spot. And Domitian knew that People didn't believe in plots to kill the Emperor until the Emperor turned up dead one day. And then they're all like, Oh no, this was terrible. How could we have prevented this? Domitian knows how to prevent it. Trust nobody. And assume that everyone is out to get you. And you know, for Domitian, it had always been this way. No one had wanted him as Emperor. In fact, his own father hadn't particularly wanted him for a son. By the time he was born, his older brother Titus, brave, handsome, popular Titus, was already 12 years old. And beyond the danger of the worst childhood diseases, his father was already convinced that his oldest son would live to adulthood to be his heir. So he didn't really have a use for a second son. So, while his cool older brother was off doing Roman things with dad, like prepping him for a career in politics and the military, Domitian was ignored and left at home with the women of his family. Domitian's mother and sister, who were the only family he was particularly close to, both tragically died when Domitian was quite young. And did the world offer him sympathy? No. His father and brother abandoned him to go off and win glory in the provinces, whilst he as a teenager was left in the charge of his uncle, Flavius Sabinus. And so the young man was left to stew in his grief-filled and very solitary adolescence, spending hours a day in a room by himself, killing flies as the only form of entertainment. And what did people do? They mocked him, of course, because the Romans were relentlessly cruel in making fun of people that they considered a little bit odd. Where's Domitian, people would ask. Alone would be the answer, 
with not even a fly for company. This angsty but relatively peaceful adolescence was interrupted when chaos erupted in the Roman Empire. The Emperor Nero was forced out of power and made to commit suicide, and in the following year, four men would declare themselves emperor and fight to the death for the position. One of them was Domitian's dear absent father, Vespasian, but dad was all the way in the eastern provinces, and Domitian, alone with his uncle in Rome, was in the heart of enemy territory. His uncle and guardian, Sabinus, was eventually killed by the followers of the Emperor Vitellius, and Domitian only escaped with his life by disguising himself as a follower of the goddess Isis and then going into hiding. But he didn't have to hide for long. The civil war that we remember as the year of the four emperors was coming to an end, and Vespasian was winning. Soon the city of Rome fell into the hands of his loyalists, and Domitian was safe. And when all of the battles were over and Vespasian was the undisputed master of the Roman Empire, he organized a triumph, which was a great big party where there would be a procession through the streets and a celebration of how great he was. He rode at the front of his uh, procession in a chariot, next to him his son and heir, Domitian's older brother, Titus, acting almost like gods as they absorbed all of the glory going through the streets of Rome. And where was Domitian for all of this? Well, he was at the back on a horse with the rest of the family, as if he were some distant cousin or strange, estranged relative, and not the emperor's actual son. And to make things worse, now that it was peacetime and Vespasian's regime had gotten itself settled, Domitian started asking for actual responsibilities. You know, to be treated like an actual member of the imperial family. And sure, Vespasian kept him happy by giving him the occasional ceremonial post, but no actual responsibility, no. That might step on the toes of his older brother and the son and heir, Titus. So no, Domitian couldn't rely on anyone. Nobody wanted him as emperor. His own father didn't even seem to want him as a son. The only reason he was emperor at all in the end was because that same brother, Titus, died after a relatively short reign without any children. I mean, sure, everyone said they loved Domitian as emperor. Everyone always says they love the Emperor because Rome is full of sycophants, and none of them are worse than the old men of the Senate. The corrupt, amoral, and decadent, the lot of them. I mean, the Roman Republic had ended over a hundred years ago, and here were these jumped-up rich kids swaggering around in togas, acting like they still owned the place. But Domitian knew their game. They'd sucked up to the Emperor Nero as well, right up until the point that they'd betrayed him and they'd done the same with every past emperor. No, the Senate couldn't be trusted. They were disloyal and self-interested, and it was embarrassing. Rome was meant to be the beacon of civilization in a world full of barbarism, and here was the Senate, the oldest and most distinguished body in the city, singing and dancing, acting in plays, fornicating and drinking the whole night through. Domitian found the whole thing honestly disgusting. And what was worse is when he tried to rectify the problem and remind the Roman people that they only had their empire by the good graces of their gods, and those gods were only kept happy by good morals and pious behavior, they considered him a tyrant for it. I mean, some of the city's Vestal Virgins, for example, were found to be having affairs and liaisons on the side. And Domitian, who was rightfully outraged by this, went by the traditional Roman punishment for this kind of thing, and he bricked them up inside of a wall to perish there. But the Roman people have become so accustomed to debauchery and impiety that they considered this a cruel measure. But that was the traditional Roman punishment for this kind of a thing. And besides, the, it was their own fault. They were the ones who broke their vows as Vestal Virgins. I mean, the clue is in the name, Virgins. And don't think that Domitian didn't know the cause of all of these problems. It was those Greek philosophers coming over here from the East with their funny ideas and their questioning of the world around them. No, it was dangerous for Roman society, so he had a lot of them banished, banished back to where they belonged. And on top of that was the corruption. Corruption was rampant in the city of Rome, walking hand in hand, not surprisingly, with this moral decline. Senators taking bribes, skimming off the top, enriching themselves in their office. But Domitian knew how to solve this. Any offence whatsoever, no matter how small, he'd seize all of their property. Obviously, this was very unpopular amongst the senatorial class, but, you know, it was their own fault. 
They were the ones failing to do their patriotic duty by spending that money on things other than Rome. And Domitian knew that behind their smiles, all of the senators really hated him, made fun of him, laughed at him for his introversion, his social awkwardness and his baldness. I mean, most men go bald. It's nothing to be ashamed of or to laugh at. Granted, Domitian had gone bald especially early in life, and it is kind of weird that whilst he was bald, he issued a pamphlet on hair care. I guess that is kind of humorous, but... He's the emperor, damn it. Making fun of the emperor is making fun of Rome, and that is probably treason, I think. In fact, if you look very, very carefully, you can see treason starting to develop in the most benign places. I mean, a good example is this. The Romans like to name and rename their slaves, you know, give them funny names and things like that. It's all normal stuff. Uh, it's normal if you live in one of the largest slave societies in history. But take this guy, for example. He's named two of his slaves Hannibal and Mago. Do you know who Hannibal and Mago were? Well, they were enemies of Rome. And here he is, naming his slaves after enemies of Rome. Do you know what that makes him? An enemy of Rome. I mean, if, if you think about it. Like, if you, if, you, if you really, really think about it. Look, I, the, the point is, this may all seem over the top, and maybe even a little bit paranoid, but it's necessary, because the Emperor has a lot of enemies. You know, he makes enemies just by being Emperor. Just by trying to do right by his realm, he's bound to make enemies. Enemies everywhere everywhere. The Roman Empire was unsafe as long as the Emperor Domitian was still alive. At least, that's what the conspirators who were preparing to murder him thought. And they weren't alone. The Emperor had made enemies, and there were plenty of individuals and groups within the Empire who had good reason to want him gone. But even though a lot of people want Domitian dead, you can never be too careful. After all, the Emperor has agents everywhere, which is why I've taken the precaution of turning the lights down slightly and putting this hood on, which should make us more difficult to overhear. Certainly, no senator could consider himself safe as long as Domitian was still in power. They were supposed to be the governing body of Rome, the last stronghold of republicanism. Without the blessing of the Senate, the Emperor was basically nothing more than a military dictator, but that was something that Domitian, who called himself Lord and God, seemed to be okay with. To him, the Senate was just an irritation and a cash cow, there to provide him money and receive from him cruelty. And it wasn't only senators who had good reason to fear Domitian. I mean, there was always the freedmen, who were a bizarre class of freed slaves whose rights and responsibilities towards their ex-master was kind of ill-defined. So, for example, when the Emperor Nero was pushed out of power, he ordered one of his freedmen to help him kill himself. Later on, Domitian would have that freedman executed, under the condition that a freedman should never harm his ex-master, even if he's ordered to do it. No, freedmen aren't safe either. And what about family? Family meant nothing to Domitian. In fact, his own niece had had to just watch as Domitian had her husband put to death on some ridiculous trumped-up religious charge. No. Not a single member of the Flavian family could count themselves safe as long as Domitian is still around. There's only one way to remove an emperor. But how do you kill a man whose guard is never really down? I mean, we've already seen the almost extreme measures that Domitian goes to to make sure his palace is secure. It's hard enough getting access to the emperor's person, let alone doing it with a weapon. Well, eventually a dream team came together with an answer. An eclectic mix of freedmen, bureaucrats, and quite possibly, the Emperor's own niece. They may not seem like a crack assassination squad, but between them they have the skills and the positions to get close to the Emperor. The most important person in the plot would be Stephanus. He's the steward of the Emperor's resentful niece, Domitilla. It's his involvement in the whole thing that's the reason why historians suspect that perhaps Domitilla was behind the whole thing. He's important because he's a regular face around the palace, so his presence is never suspicious. But how to get a weapon on him and then into the palace? Well, that's a little bit more difficult, but Stephanus had a solution. He pretended to break his arm, and that way everyone got used to him walking around with a cast on. That way, when the time came, he could conceal a weapon between his arm and the cast, and everyone would be none the wiser. But how to get the Emperor off his guard? 
Well, it's a little bit more difficult. As we know, Domitian is at his most anxious around midday, because once upon a time an astrologer had told him that he was destined to die at noon. Now, of course, one solution to this could be kill him in the evening, but these are the Romans we're talking about, prophecies have to be adhered to, and plots need to be unnecessarily complex. So, they get the servants in on the plot, specifically the servant who's in charge of informing the emperor of the time. And then we get him to tell the emperor it's actually two or three hours later into the afternoon than it actually is, and Domitian will relax. Or at least, as much as Domitian ever relaxes. But they still have to get the emperor somewhere where he was alone and vulnerable, which is tricky because you know, he's got all that polished moonstone on the wall so he can always see behind him, and the palace is full of very loyal guards that Domitian pays well. Stephanus' solution is to tell Domitian about a plot against his life. Not THE plot, not like the one we're talking about here, a different one, I don't know, he makes something up. Either way, he gets the Emperor under the impression that he can't safely talk about this thing anywhere just around the palace, so Domitian invites him into his private bedchamber, away from prying ears. But wait, this still isn't foolproof. Domitian might not have been the hardened warrior and conqueror that his older brother or his father were, but he was still pretty handy with a weapon, and he stashes swords all around the place. Specifically, he's got one in his bedchamber, under his pillow. What happens if Stephanus draws the knife, and Domitian whips out a much, much larger sword, kills Stephanus, and then figures out the plot retrospectively? But there's a solution to this. We have the servants in on the plot, remember? So one of the servants goes into the bedchamber to, I don't know, clean it or something, takes away the sword that Domitian keeps under his pillow, and replaces it with just a handle. That way, if things go south, Domitian sees the handle, thinks, oh, there's a sword there, like there always is, good and safe, grabs it, it's just a useless hunk of wood. So the plan goes ahead. Stephanus follows the Emperor into his bedchamber, and when the door is shut and he's sure they're alone, BAM! He stabs him right in the crotch. Which is a little bit extra if you ask me, but I guess he really hated the guy. But Domitian fights back, and they grapple and struggle for a while. He even manages to mortally wound Stephanus. And before long, they're both lying on the floor, bleeding out. He went out fighting, but Domitian had suffered seven stab wounds, one of which was inhumane even by the standards of a stabbing, and he quickly bled out. And so passed from history the reign of the Emperor Domitian, 11th Emperor of Rome. He was 44 years old, and he'd reigned for 15 years and four days. Nobody liked him, no one had wanted him, and nobody would miss him. When Domitian died, the Senate damned his memory, which was something that the Romans did when they felt that someone was so awful they weren't even worth remembering. And, you know, Domitian really doesn't come across well in our ancient sources. He uh, calls himself Lord and God, which doesn't really make him a relatable leader. And he personally comes across as being disrespectful, unlikable, and at times a little bit sadistic. So when Domitian was murdered, everyone was relieved, right? Well, the senators certainly were. He hated them, and they hated him. But the regular people apparently greeted news of Domitian's death with relative indifference. I mean, no one seems to have mourned particularly hard, but neither did they take to the streets to start yelling into the Tiber with his body, as they had done with previous unpopular emperors. And this makes sense, because Domitian was definitely authoritarian and sometimes cruel, but he reserved that side of himself primarily for the nobility. To the regular people, his reign was relatively peaceful, pretty stable, and hey, he opened that brand new amphitheatre that's being built for the last few years, and brought in some new festivals and public banquets and things like that. And the army bloody loved him. They were basically the only group to have reacted badly to the news of his death. Domitian had never been the conquering hero or the fierce warrior that his older brother or his dad had been, but the soldiers definitely appreciated the respect he showed them, along with the massive pay increase that he gave them. In fact, when he does die and the Senate damn his memory, some of the soldiers are furious at the way that he's being treated posthumously, and some of them even demand the execution of Domitian's assassins. All of this isn't to say that Domitian was necessarily a good emperor. I mean, he was 
definitely a brutal autocrat, and being a part of his Senate sounds pretty rough. But it really is the Senate and the top 1% of ultra-wealthy nobility who seem to have had a problem with him. And they make up more or less all of our written sources on his reign. So it's worth remembering that the view we get of Domitian is the kind of narrow view of these aristocratic, wealthy people. Not really representative of what everyone in the Empire thought. And even the written sources that we have may not be speaking completely honestly. When Domitian dies, he dies without an obvious heir, and the Flavian dynasty that he was a part of just ends with him. And a new group of emperors come in and they start doing things differently. And it's under these new emperors that all of the histories of Domitian's reign are written. And let's not forget about the violence of Domitian's death. For the sake of their own legitimacy and to make it look like they weren't benefiting from just cold-hearted murder, it was very much in the interests of the new regime to make the old look as tyrannical and brutal as possible. And what of those that maybe benefited from Domitian's regime? I mean, a good example is the historian Tacitus, who doesn't have anything good to say about the Emperor Domitian. He's all like, Oh, wasn't it terrible? The tyrannical reign of Domitian, what an awful time for us Romans. But historians haven't failed to note that the career of Tacitus and of his close family went pretty well during the reign of Domitian. So maybe he feels guilty or insecure or something like that, about the fact that, you know, he was kind of on the up and up whilst his fellow senators were being executed. And maybe he's retrospectively trying to change things up a bit, being a bit like, oh no, I never liked him. No, 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 it's, uh, it's nothing to do with me. I, I wasn't a part of that regime or anything like that. Or maybe Tacitus and his contemporaries are just telling us the truth. After all, all, all of their accounts of Domitian's reign are pretty consistent with each other. And, you know, it was all in living memory, so you couldn't just make stuff up out of nowhere, otherwise people would notice. The point isn't to say that Domitian was the victim of some posthumous smear campaign and that he was actually a really good emperor, only that our view of him comes through the lenses of the aristocratic senatorial class and their concerns, and might not be completely representative of what all of Rome felt about him. Domitian is a curious figure in Roman history, He's authoritarian and cruel, but he's always got a point or a policy. His crimes, as they come down to us from the Roman written sources, are never random or completely self-interested like those of Caligula or Nero. They're always used to enforce an idea. He wielded power without any reservation whatsoever, but not particularly irresponsibly by the standards of the day. And he left the empire kind of no better or no worse than he found it. At least not as far as we can see it 2,000 years later. To me at least, Domitian comes across as being both a sincere conservative in his social values and a hardline pragmatist as a politician. He had a very, very clear idea of what Rome should be and how Romans should act, and he didn't have any time for messy Republican facades or the politicking that went along with it, and this really didn't work out for him. He also comes across as being a little bit of a tragic figure. You know, he spends his entire life in the shadow of his much more popular father and brother, and then when his brother dies somewhat unexpectedly without an heir, he's thrust into the position of being the most powerful man in the world. Or, in the words of my college history teacher, and we're going way back when to Game of Thrones was still very culturally relevant. But he's like Stannis Baratheon, the kind of unwanted younger brother who ends up becoming king and is obsessed with people showing him the respect that he thinks he deserves in a world that requires a little bit more politicking. Well, that is actually perhaps a little bit harsh on Stannis, Domitian is worse. I don't really know how to end the video because uh, there's not really a conclusion to this. So I, I just wanted to talk about Domitian and his murder because I thought it was interesting. But um, I suppose, you know, thank you all, the new ones of you, for subscribing. I mean, this time last year I had less than a thousand subscribers and now I've got over four thousand of you for some reason listening to me talk about mostly Roman history. I'll probably branch out into different bits of history, I reckon. You know, my interest is going to different places. I'm 
going a little bit more medieval nowadays. I don't know, let me know what you think. If there's anything you'd like to see. Other than that, yeah, cheers. Thanks for watching.